Hi everybody, we're just waiting for everybody to join and we'll get started shortly, so just please bear with us. If you could just in the Q&A, just let us know where you're from, that would be great. So as you get into the room, if you could just pop in your um, location, that would be great. And then we'll get started once everyone's joined. Wow, we've got a comrade from Spain. Welcome. Okay, we'll make a start. So I'm pleased to welcome uh, you all to tonight's event, the topic of which is the virus doesn't discriminate, the system does. Why we need to tackle race and class inequality, which is part of the Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas and is supported by a number of groups across the Labour left. I'll introduce myself. I'm Nadia Jarma. I'm the BAME officer for Sheffield Central CLP, and I'm also a Stand Up to Racism activist. So um, I'll be chairing tonight's discussion. Um, all around us, we are seeing people say enough is enough and that black lives matter. And this meeting will look at why the Labour and the left must be central to and fully stand with this movement. I truly believe we are at a significant point in time. But before we start, I want to send my solidarity to my black and Asian brothers and sisters, as this year has been particularly hard for, for us all. We've basically been told that COVID-19 disproportionately kills us because of our underlying conditions. This was even used initially to justify the horrific murder of George Floyd. Somehow his underlying conditions contributed to his death. I'd like to say to my comrades, please take time for self-care. The trauma of racism in our daily existence lays heavy on the heart and there is no denying that pain. I've seen and heard it so much over the last few weeks here in the UK and in America. So solidarity. I'm going to quote Bell. Um, Bell said the only way to tackle BAME health inequalities is to tackle the underlying cause, racism. Arise is also a festival of internationalism and unity and this event couldn't be more timely as we face Trump with a far-right agenda in the midst of a global pandemic and recent events which have set off a global outcry for material change. Tonight, due to the amazing level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we are also streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page. Please post your questions in the comments below the stream on there and in the Q&A section on Zoom. And we will put some of those questions to our panel a little later on. We've got an incredible lineup of speakers for you tonight. And I'd like to start with our first speaker, Belle Ribeiro Addy, MP. Bell is a brilliant campaigner and a socialist MP who was elected in the 2019 general election. Every time I hear Bell speak on a panel or on TV, I admire her more and more. So let's start. Over to you, Bell. with this bell I'm just there. I know it was me I had myself muted <laughs> sorry 
Um, thanks very much, Nadia. And thank you very much to Arise for organising this really important event. As we can see today from the new death toll figures, um, this, this, this is far from over. Uh, we, we continue to ease lockdown uh, with, without any consideration for the impact that it could have on, on BAME people. And as we open more and more businesses up, I only fear that it, this will get worse. And, you know, we've watched for the past couple of months now, and I can hardly believe it's been a couple of months, with horror as the government have messed their response to coronavirus up in the most catastrophic way. You know, when you look at something and you cannot believe that somebody could get this so monumentally wrong from what they've done on on PPE, from what they've done on testing, um, from, from starting lockdown too late to finding out that they were sending elderly people back to care homes when they had coronavirus. All of these things, all, all, all compounded, just make you think what, what on earth, what on earth has been going on? How, how could anybody get things so monumentally wrong? But this is what this government is. They, they have absolutely botched their response to this crisis. And, and to make matters worse, um, we can see that as we, we, we're heading for an economic recession, they are likely to move on to their usual program of austerity. Now, thinking of things like PPE, let's not forget that part of the reason why all of that has gone so badly is because they outsourced it. They outsourced it, privatized it, and, and, and a, a company that was trying to get the cheapest deal messed it up when there was PPE right here being made in the UK at a slightly higher price. And it makes you question what our lives worth. Now, um, at the moment, we're seeing a situation where BAME people are up to up to four times more likely to sign. Even when you remove all of these, these so-called underlying health conditions, they're still up to two times more likely to sign. And if that's not something that the government should be taking seriously, I don't know what is. When this crisis started, they immediately saw they didn't require any sort of you know long standing review for it that elderly people were at risk they immediately saw with people that people with certain underlying health conditions were at risk and slightly later we realized that that people from bone backgrounds were at risk but all of a sudden you know th the rhetoric changed so when it comes to black issues we always have to stop and have a review and think about it there's nothing about taking action immediately I, and i just think I think about that at the moment in terms of what's happening and what sparked the Black Lives Matter protests. I think about the fact that when a, a black man has died in custody, we have to stop and we have to look and we have to think about what happened. You could see someone with a knee in someone's neck and the fact that they're saying they can't breathe. And we still require, you know, a masses of investigation before we could possibly conclude that that would be the effect of their death. And I think to myself, why, why is it always when it comes to black issues, it, it's, such a, it's such a pandemonium, it takes so much time before any action is taken. And, and that's what it is. That, is, that is structural racism. And it will, it will, it will continue until we, we take more of a stand. I'm really, really um, you know, em, emboldened by all of the protests that have been happening and actually by the fact that they've been sustained. What I would say is because this hasn't happened, um, because this has happened before rather, you know, we see these racist protests spark up. Um, people are really enraged, uh, the media follow along, but it, it all of a sudden usually dies down. But these these have been quite sustained and we're already seeing change. So this is, this is a moment that we need to seize upon, but it's a moment we need to seize upon in, in an organized way. We need to understand that as, as we're heading for a very difficult financial times, pressure will bear on our communities the most. And sometimes that can mean um, that we take our eye off the ball in terms of campaigning, but we can't let that happen. And even now, even before we hit those times, and even while we're still, you know, we're, we're protesting, uh, we're being active, people are, people are making demands, um, you know, of their councils, and people are taking, people, all sorts of institutions are being very, very clear. They want to show that they are on the right side of things. Even, even within that time, we, we do have to look and continue to be focused on the fact that if we don't force the government, force employers, force, uh, you, you know, and, and different institutions such as, such as schools or any, any organisation that may have a lot of BAME MPs to, to take matters seriously in terms of health, we could see a greater level of, of, of BAME deaths from this disease. And I, I think it's really, really um, disingenuous for, for the Home Secretary to be coming out and saying that 
uh, you know, young black people protesting are likely to cause uh, a, a, a spark, a, a wave, and a second wave in terms of the coronavirus. I think that's really unfair, given that we've seen loads of people flocking to the beaches of the UK. And actually, given that we are still yet to hear any sort of remorse for what Dominic Cummings has done in terms of breaking the lockdown rules. And we know for a fact that already, without even having another long investigation, that, that, that black people are actually have been more likely to be fined um, for coronavirus violations than white people have. So in, 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 in this context, we need to be very clear that, that, that even though people are making certain overtures, you've got all of a sudden Boris has come out with a, with a lovely statement about how he understands and he's instructed, instructed his ministers to stop saying that there's no racism in the country, that it's going to take a lot more than their warm words to 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 bring about change and we need to keep the pressure up um we need to keep we need to keep organized we need to keep focused um, and more importantly we need to make sure that they don't waste time in what they've usually been doing is you know have a long review could we do need that public inquiry 100 but we don't need it to be so lengthy because a lot of this information and a lot of these recommendations have been put out before we can't have a situation where people are just wringing their hands and saying oh gosh isn't that bad and no proper action is is is, is taken we need to go back look at all of those things go right back to the mcpherson inquiry and question why all of those things have not been implemented properly and and and, and take it from there and, and go through all of those recommendations put them in place and 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 and, and i think I, I i believe that if they actually put the proper resources behind it we could see real change in this country but until then we'll find ourselves continually in this situation so thank you very much again to, to arise for for inviting me to speak and thank you very much for everybody who continues to stand up against racism i hope you are as emboldened as i am right now and that you continue to come up come out and make your voice heard thank you bell that was amazing there were so many points there that you raised you know the lockdown being the phony lockdown for me um, was key to all of this you know recession and austerity we know that you know 10 years of that that our communities faced um, and you know we have to make sure this isn't just a rally cry it has to be a daily reality that black lives matter so thank you for that bell okay going to go over to our next speaker now um, so Roger um, Mackenzie is the Deputy General Secretary of Unison. So, Roger, are you ready? We'd like to hear from you now. Okay. Th thanks very much for the for the opportunity to join you. Um, first of all, I'm not the Deputy General Secretary. We haven't got one. I'm an Assistant General Secretary um, of Unison. Those things have to be right, as people get upset. Um, that's all right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share the platform, um, online platform with such great comrades who have done so much over the years and stood up um, against racism, even when it's uncomfortable um, to do it. Um, because I think very much that's what that's the kind of situation um, that we're in now. And I'll come back to that um, point um, in a minute. But anybody who thinks that the current moment that we're in is just about George Floyd, is just about Ahmed Arbery, is just about Breonna Taylor, is just about COVID-19, is really, really missing the point. Absolutely missing the point. This is about so much more. This is a pent up anger, a rage about the levels of racism that we have been experiencing as black people for so many years. We get warm words from people who say that they understand what we're going through, who say that they're doing things to deal with it. They say all we have to be is patient. Um, we have to just wait because things will right themselves apparently. Well, all of us on this panel and so many people listening to this and watching this have heard these things before far too often and we are fed up with this with this we are fed up with the warm words and that's why people are rising up um, about the racism that is being experienced right now and that we are seeing it's not just the fact as bad as it is that you see filmed you see filmed somebody being lynched 
as we did with Ahmed Arbery and as we did with George Floyd. It's more than that. We all know about the levels of um, the numbers of black people who, who die in police custody in this country and nothing is done about it. We get another report about it. So there's a little review. Then there's a report of the review. Then there's the book of the of the report of the review. And then there's probably a film starring Denzel Washington or something of the book of the film of the of the review. And then at the end of it, the thing that we all know that happens is that nothing changes. This is my most important point. If we ever allow this to be just a moment, another moment that we have to experience as black people, and we don't turn this into a movement, then we have really missed a golden opportunity. We cannot allow organisations or, po or senior politicians or any politicians or any employer, um, because they're all queuing up at the minute to say that they all understand us, and I'll come back to that, and Johnson in a minute as well, but they're all queuing up to say how they understand what's going on. But what we all know from our experience is that very little will happen. In fact, what I know from my experience is nothing will happen unless black people stand up, organize and fight for change, real systematic fundamental change. The fact that we lost the general election as a party in, in December doesn't change the, the absolute bottom line of that. And the bottom line of that still stands good today. In fact, I would say it is more the point today. And that is we absolutely need a fundamental and irreversible shift in society in favour of working class people, because then we can really start to see a shift um, away from this ingrained racism that is taking place um, across our societies at the minute. So I don't, I don't need somebody who talks about water, watermelon smiles and talking about letterboxes when he's talking to uh, talking about Muslim women. I don't need somebody like that to tell me um, that they understand because I know and we all know that that's utter rubbish. I also don't need people to criticize my friends and my comrades and harass my friends and comrades who are standing up against racism. So, um, so, so like Claudia, like um, Dawn, like um, Diane, all of these people like Bell who are getting abuse from people because they are prepared to stand up and say what is going on and tell truth to power. We all have to stand with them and we all have to stand up for what we believe in, because this is the moment where if we ever allow organisations to fall back into quick fix mode, because that's what they always do, they fall into this real quick fix mode. All we got to do to get people off the streets, stop people from protesting, is build them a little youth club or something, or, or, or create a little new and skanky little job scheme or something, and then everything's going to be all right. Well, it will be all right for them but it won't be all right for us because we'll still be experiencing racism in the workplace. We'll still be experiencing racism in our communities. We'll still be scared about going back um, to work um, during COVID-19. We'll still be scared about going back into unsafe workplaces because nobody said why it is that black people are getting um, this virus more than anybody else. Nobody has said why we're dying more than everybody else. All they come up with is, um, you know, excuses that it's really our fault because we're lacking in vitamin D and such nonsense. This is rubbish, right? Nobody's saying anything about the fact that we're expected to go to work on public transport systems that we that are potentially death traps because nobody has said anything about our safety. Nobody is doing anything. The only way change happens, the only way change happens is if we as I said before, we stand up and organise and make sure things happen. Nobody has ever given us anything, ever, without us fighting for it first. And that's what we have to do now. We have to make sure that this moment becomes a movement. It is a fundamental issue for us that people don't forget in an instant all the things that have gone on and think they can get away with it with a quick fix. This is the time not just for warm words, but this is a time for organisers. This is a time when people have to go out and build in their workplaces, build in their communities, because that, at the end of the day, is how we're going to make a difference. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Roger. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have seen the public health um, record really not 
report not really showing us um, any evidence of what's been going on. I think, you know, language is really important and what we saw in America and what we've seen here, you know, black people are being lynched and we need to talk about that. Since 1990, there have been 250 deaths in police custody of black people and not one police officer has been charged with any offence and that for me is just outrageous you know at the moment you're right absolutely we are still not really seeing any evidence from the hostile environment about what the government is going to do and Grenfell three years on um, you know it's still absolutely outrageous so thank you for your contribution there Roger. Okay, so on to our next speaker, we have Murad Koreshe, who is the chair of Stop the War Coalition and is also a Labour Assembly member. So over to you, Murad. Thank you, Nadia, for uh, introducing me. And can I thank also Arise uh, for giving me this opportunity at this very pertinent point in history, as Roger emphasised, we've got to get our acts together. I'll try not to duplicate what both Bell and Roger have said, but uh, I'll start from a personal basis. Four years ago, I, um, I went on this, uh, on this day, uh, on this uh, very day, I, was, I, I made my way to America to go to Muhammad Ali's funeral in Louisville. And the reality is, if I tried to do that in uh, Trump's America, there's no way I could have done it. He's had the, since he's been in power, he's had the Muslim travel ban. He's blaming the Chinese for everything. And he's shown total indifference uh, to black deaths uh, under the police. Um, and that's, that's where we are in, in the world today. Um, my brother lives in Chicago. Um, I spoke to him a few nights ago. And he told, I, I just gently prodded him and said, you're going to have a very hot summer, aren't you? He said, hot summer, this isn't going to end in the summer. This is going to go all the way up to November. So we need an internationalist perspective on this and not lose sight of things. And we've got to support our colleagues in the States to move this uh, psychopath on. And I think one of the things we have got to do on the race issue about what we've seen in the last few months in response to the COVID uh, pandemic is the anti-Chinese sentiments being expressed. It comes up everywhere now. Um, I can remember the Chinese New Year. Um, I picked up some of it. I noticed that uh, the business trade in, trade in Chinatown in London was, was down 50%, um, but we hadn't come to the point of a complete lockdown. Um, since then, um, I've, I've got reports from the Met Police showing quite clearly a lot of hate crime has been a, uh, aimed at East Asians. So we've got to look out for them in, all, in, in these present circumstances. Um, and, and all this has been agitated un undoubtedly by the sentiments uh, conveyed by Trump and the other side of the pond and now um, con continually, continuously relayed as well here by the right wing of both the Tory party and also uh, elements outside of, um, outside of uh, the normal discourse. But ultimately, you know, we we've got to remember if we're going to defeat this pandemic, uh, we're going to have to cooperate internationally, both economically and medically. Um, the, as, as the title of our uh, session, session tonight suggests very clearly, um, the virus doesn't discriminate between black, brown, yellow and whatever, uh, but the system does. And that's what's clearly happening here. Um, I, was, I was quite impressed with, I've been very impressed with what the Germans have been doing. I think uh, it helps to have a scientist at the helm of things to get on top of the science. Not, 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 it's not as though um, the, the British government's been doing that, although they say they've been following the science. But the German president there said it quite well. Uh, um, Frank Walter, he said, it's not a war, which is the analogy most people make with this battle we've got with the virus, but it's a test for humanity. And it's, it's, and it's, it's striking how uh, the USA under Trump has walked away from the one entity that could probably bring us together to get vaccines sorted and things like this and get uh, knowledge shared across the world. Uh, they've walked out of the World Health Organization. Um, walked straight away and want to withdraw their money as well as soon as possible. Um, and, and sticking to the USA, I mean, it, it is striking. I mean, more often than not, we hear US presidents declaring war on other people around the world, whether it be during the Vietnam War against the Vietnamese, 
or during at the turn of this century uh, uh, against the Iraqis. This president has actually declared war on his own people and he is instigating without any doubts. Um, um, listening to my brother and other people that I keep in touch with in America, a race war. And that's what, it, that's what he's pushing for. And he thinks he can win an election on that basis. Um, and, you know, the, 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 um, the, the um, but, and as Roger said, uh, you know, that the, they are lynchings in all, in, in the modern context, what happened to George Floyd. But this doesn't happen one off. This happens regularly, day in, day out. Uh, my brother was saying two week, uh, the previous weekend, they had 15 such similar incidences in Chicago alone. So you can just imagine what's happening there. And it goes back actually even beyond slavery. You've got to remember when the um, uh, when European colonizers first went to America, they practically did away with all the Native Americans. That genocide of, 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 of uh, colonization is often forgotten. And I don't think we should look, it should be lost in this narrative. And coming back to slavery, there was an interesting thing. When I went to um, Muhammad Ali's uh, funeral four years ago, there was an interesting discussion there uh, about uh, the West African slaves that came, were forced over uh, to the States. And they reckon about 30 to 50% were probably Muslims. Um, but I can tell you this, there's no records of them uh, being allowed to pray five times a day. There were no records when they were slaves that they were allowed to congregate together and pray uh, once a week together and, and what have you. This has got history and we shouldn't lose this at all. We need to, um, we need to occupy the historical interpretation of all these events going further back. And that's why I have been, um, I, I've been, heightened, uh, I've been glad to see some of the direct action policy that have been taken by the, the young. Under 30 year olds have spontaneously taken literally matters into their own hands. And do you think that Bristol statue would have been pulled down um, if they'd waited for the council or the, the, all the other processes that have been around for decades? No, and we've seen you know, the, the, the knock on effects. We've now seen in London another statue taken down last night We've got the mayor of London looking at the public realm and all the statues that we have representing the great and the good from that uh, uh, the slavery era. That is where we are. We've got to make the most of it. I certainly do as a London Assembly member, making the representations for all our BAME communities on who, who they personally object to. And that also will go further than just BAME communities, the, um, the Caribbean folk, African folk and Asians. I think we've got to look out for the Irish as well. I've only, only in the last few five years really understood what happened in the English Civil War and what Cromwell got up to in Ireland. They've got as much of a legitimate case and objections about uh, people uh, like Cromwell, physical, physical presence in the UK. The reality is this history lesson we've got to give, most Brits don't know. And I think we've just got to be courageous enough to tell them what, tell them what they haven't heard and tell, tell them the, telling it to them in very frank terms. So I look forward to the opportunity uh, to, to state in that, and I'm glad that Arise has given me this opportunity, and I trust all my colleagues will do the same, because I think uh, one of the lessons I learned from my father, certainly, was that um, very often history is the victor's version of events. Well, this time, we've got to change history and make sure the victim's version of events are also heard loud and clear. Thank you for that, Murad. I think, um, you know, the decolonisation of education is a really important thing for here in the UK as well. Um, you know, the removal of the statue is great to see, but it's going to take more than that. And I think Roger's raised it. This has to be more than a moment. We've got to take this and make it a movement. Um, so I just wanted to say we've got over 250 people online with us tonight. So that is great. Um, I'm just going to move over to our final speaker before we take questions. Um, and that is the awesome Claudia Webb, MP for Leicester East, who is also the vice chair of one of our supporting organisations tonight, the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. So over to you, Claudia. Thank you uh, so much for that introduction. And thank you to the organizers, of course, the, for putting on this event today. And it is vital uh, that the socialist left stands fully 
uh, with the Black Lives Movement supports Black self-organization and puts the struggle uh, against racism up front and central. You know, events like tonight are vital in this regard. As the representative of Leicester East, one of the most diverse constituencies in the country, it has been extremely concerning to see the disproportionate uh, impact of the coronavirus upon African, Asian and minority ethnic uh, communities. You know, this uh, was proven, of course, by the government's own report, which uh, they shame fully only published after repeated uh, pressure and which does not outline any protective measures to deal with the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. Uh, the office, we know from the, the Office for National Statistics found that black people are one, uh, almost two times more likely to die than white people, or um, Bangladeshi and Pakistani descent, 1.8 times more likely to die and people with of Indian descent 1.5 times more likely to die and be killed by COVID-19. Uh, These figures reflect in a sense the severe racial disparities in our economy. We've got the Resolution Foundation think tank uh, which estimate that African, Caribbean, Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi employees um, experience an annual pay penalty of 3.2 billion. Imagine that. Analysis from Public Health, we know, Public Health England showed that once in hospital, people from African, Asian and minority ethnic back backgrounds were more likely to, to require intensive care. So the reality is our communities accounted for 11% of those hospitalised by COVID-19, but over 36% of those were admitted to critical care. So many have tried to dismiss this imbalance in deaths as as being explained by cultural or even genetic uh, differences. Yet discrimination is deeply uh, ingrained in the social, the political, the economic structures of our uh, whole society. So the scourge of racism results in unequal access to quality education, uh, good quality food, livable wages, and affordable housing, which are the foundations really of health and well-being. This is the context this is the context in which the coronavirus crisis is operating, and we should never forget that. The uneven deaths reflect a global economic system which has been built upon racialized extraction. And these figures underscore what we already know, that existing racial and class inequalities coupled with inadequate government support mean that working class people, migrants and African, Asian and minority ethnic communities are at greater risk and exposure to COVID-19. So the, the, the severe racial disparities in our economy mean that as African, as Asian, as minority ethnic people, we are more likely to fall through the cracks of government's uh, uh, financial support and therefore more likely to be forced to work in unsafe uh, conditions. That is the context. And so as we see the inspiring crowds of protesters across the country, as, we, as, we, as they have shown us in recent weeks, it is crucial, absolutely crucial that we in the UK do not assume that we are immune from the disease of state sanctioned racism. The fact that our own government headed up by a prime minister with a long history um, as, as Roger's already ind indicated, a long history of racist comments does not recognise that racial discrimination exists in Britain today, demonstrates the need for our peaceful action. So let us not forget that we have a prime minister who, in, who wrote in 2005 that it was only natural for the public to fear Islam, who in 2018 compared Muslim women who wear burqas to letterboxes and bank robbers, who has referred to black people as a pickaninnies with watermelon smiles, who said, said that seeing a bunch of black kids makes him turn a hair. The fact that we have an overtly racist individual as Boris Johnson ascend to the nation's highest office reveals the corrosive legacy of empire within the British establishment. You know, it's not just the statues that we need to knock down, it's, it's quite frankly, the very heart of British establishment. So I stand 
in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests here in Leicester and across the UK. And I will continue to support those across the world who are safely and peacefully protesting systems of racist oppression following the murder of George Floyd. You know, organized peaceful resistance, history has shown us it's a force for change and is deserving of our full support. The question ahead of us is how can we transform the Black Lives Matter from a crucial slogan to a reality of daily life? Black lives means that the government must urgently launch a public inquiry into the discrepancies of COVID-19 deaths and Public Health England must issue a practical guidance and protections at, to at, for at-risk communities. Black lives means reforming the UK's racist criminal justice system um, in which black people are disproportionately suffer uh, from police use of force and are overrepresented in the prison system uh, and prison population. And Black Lives Matter means justice. It means justice for the victims of Grenfell Tower and the Windrush generation. Black Lives Matter means that we, that when a black person dies in police custody, as they disproportionately do, the incident is thoroughly investigated and the police face justice and that they cannot ex escape uh, with so-called impunity. Ultimately, it means an end to empty platitudes. It is up to those in power to prove their actions that black lives really do matter, not just say that they do, not just kneel on one knee and say that, it, that they do. And it's up to all of us supporting this movement so that racial inequalities of all kinds are eradicated and that we can build a world that works for all of us. It's up to all of us. Because as the black radical Stokely Carmichael said, our grandfathers, our grandfathers had to run, run, run. My generation, is saying that we ain't running no more. So now is the time for us to take a stand and end the global scourge of racism, no matter what form it takes. Our position is to stand shoulder to shoulder with this movement, with young people that have organized and are marching on our streets for justice. We can't let this, this die. This movement is too crucial, crucial, happening at too crucial a time for us to simply give up now. Change is upon us and it's up to each and every one of us to show that our children really do matter. They are our future and we have a responsibility to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. So let's do that. Let's get off, off our knees actually, stand up proud and let's move forward and march for justice together. Thank you uh, very much. That was awesome, Claudia, thank you. Um, I think one of the heartening things I saw um, at the rallies that have been across the country was the younger generation saying, this is the last generation that is gonna suffer this. So I think that gives us all hope. Okay, we're gonna move into some questions now. So I'm gonna take um, three questions and um, we'll ask the panel to answer them in the order that you've spoken tonight. So, We've had a number of questions that have come up, um, obviously, about racism within the Labour Party um, in relation to the exposed um, leaked report. So um, if you could let us have your views on that. Also, we've had some questions. Um, thank you to Nicola and Jenny. Um, should we, the PLP, be arguing for special risk assessments for BAME employees in all workplaces? And the final question is, what can we all do to offer solidarity and keep up the pressure? So we can go to the panel. So Belle, are you able to answer any of those questions? We lost Belle, okay. Um, Roger, do you want to? Yeah, can, I, can I deal with what, what we're gonna do next? Because for me, this is the, the critical thing, as I said in my contribution, because this can easily be just another kind of um, episode where 
you know, Stephen Lawrence died, report was written, people do something for a little while, before too long it's forgotten about, um, somebody else dies in custody, um, we, we have an ongoing campaign, um, the relatives of the person who died continually come to our conferences and plead with us for something to change. And all those things are important to remind us of um, about what needs to happen. But the point that I always make, and I'm, I'm, I, for me, this is the most important thing about this moment. I, I said about turning the moment into a movement. And I genuinely mean that. And during the election campaign, I was talking about mm -hmm. Um, the thing that will make a difference is not individuals, so like Jeremy or, you know, kind of Claudia or Diane or anybody, right? Um, it's not about individuals. It's about creating a collective movement that is going to fight for radical and fundamental change in society. That's the thing. Now, the next question is, well, how do you go about building that movement? Well, there's, there's, there's the kind of germ of those movements around. Um, and I, and I, I think that the kind of discussions that we can have through Arise um, is really critical for what the shape of that movement is, is going to be like. But what it can't be, and th this, is all, this is the last point I'll make about it, what it can't be is just a debating place. It can't be that, right? Because that's not really going to make any fundamental difference for us. What will make the difference is, as Claudia rightly said, is peaceful protest makes the difference. That's been proven throughout history. And we've been forced to do that. We've been forced to, you know, they, we get criticised whatever um, kind of movements, whatever protests we do, we get criticised for marching, we get criticised for standing, we get criticised for kneeling, you know, we get criticised for whatever it is that we do. But what always happens is eventually people start marching with us, people start walking with us, people start kneeling with us now. Everybody knows how to kneel now. It's incredible. People have been criticised People for taking the knee now. Everybody now knows how to do it. Um, but what we need to do is set the agenda. And I think it's a final point I've made. Sorry for going on for so long. But it seems to me the people who need to be at the forefront of this need to be the people who, who feel that hurt the most. And that's why, again, Claudia's point was so important about the importance of black self-organisation in all of this, creating a black unity across people of African Asian descent in particular, that is so vital, but also white people understanding that they've got a critical role to play in fighting racism um, as well, but they shouldn't stand in front of us and filter what we've got to say. They should stand by us and work with us, not just be allies, but be collaborators in the fight against racism. Thank you, Roger, for that. That was lovely um marad do you want to come in on any of the questions do you want to just unmute yourself marad yeah i'll try and come in on the first and the third because i didn't quite understand the second one but the first i'm i'm not surprised at all about uh, what um the, the last report that came out um unofficially in jenny formbury's time reveals the anti-black prejudices within the labor party at the most senior levels um, if we're going to deal with all other forms of racism, we've got to deal with this. Diane has been a victim of this for much longer than um, people appreciate. She's not only, um, she, I mean, she's a recipient of a, most of the hate mail that I understand that goes to parliamentarians, and she's dealt with it for decades now, I think almost three decades. And to hear those uh, um, comments made on WhatsApp by the senior echelons of the party is just not acceptable. Simple as that, and, they, and it should be dealt with in, 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 in the strongest terms. And, and I don't think there's no uh, backing away. And quite honestly, if the party backs off, 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 the, off that issue in this present context, it wouldn't show, it wouldn't show uh, the Labour Party in a very good light within a, an electorate that we are critically dependent on. So that, that, that is a real litmus test for the party. Um, solidarity, I'm very heart and, uh, heartened to see all, all the young people and who've taken charge of this you know i've got to confess I, I i felt my age when i went to some of these things and they're all 30 year olds you don't have the usual suspects i.e swp and the banners of other parties it generally is spontaneous and i think what we've got to do 
is not dictate to them, but help mo mo help them mobilize. Because I think it's very important. If you're if you're going to go forward, you've got to capture your past and your present. And I think this is what this is all about um, in a generational sense. And I can't think uh, of a better generation ready to do that. If they're willing to make issues of race, of statues and whatever, uh, there's a huge basis on which you can build on. So I look forward to that. And I think one of the, those of us of any positions uh, in trade union, labor movement and in and democratically elected positions have got to foster that and it, and and with this we, we will hopefully go beyond uh, black history month because i think that gave us some space once a year i think this has got to be part and parcel of our day-to-day -day life now i was privileged to have had a different take on history from 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 my dad on the dinner table a lot of people don't and i think that is that is very important uh, that we do that and give people the uh, the environment to actually at least explore that for themselves and come to their own conclusions and hopefully similar to the conclusions we've come to, that actually most of colonization was a racist endeavor by colonizers of, of white supremacy. There's no two ways about it. And I think if, the, uh, if we can face up the establishment at any time, it's now. And I will join colleagues like Claudia, Roger and Bell on that endeavor wherever we need to be. Thank you, Murad. Claudia. Uh, well, the only... Uh, things that I would add to what has already been uh, excellently outlined already. I mean, change doesn't happen without demand. What we are seeing now is a huge d degree of passion, but anger as well. And that's why we need to grasp this moment. As adults, we can't be watching and waiting and waiting to see what the young people do. We've got to stand shoulder to shoulder. They are crying out for change. And we can't, in a sense, ever think that the, the, the party that we have, the Labour Party, is going to be their natural home. What we've got to do is, of course, change the politics. We can't have, we can't have change whilst this racist government is in power. Of course, we have to change the politics. But we can't expect that the natural home for this level of passion and energy that, is, that has arisen is going to be the Labour Party. So we've got to, in a sense, energise ourselves with young people. You know, there are new voices that have emerged through this whole uh, uh, protest and, re and reaction. There is a new wave of anger, Black uh, young people at the leadership of this peaceful protest and movement. This is not just a movement which is occurring in the UK. This is a global movement. This is about young people showing that we are internationalists and they're showing it, you know, very clearly to us. We have to be internationalists and obviously understand this as a global movement. And so we have to grasp the opportunity that we see if this movement dies, it's because we weren't angry enough. We didn't want change enough. We weren't making enough demands. There was so much that needs to be changed in our, across our uh, whole set of uh, institutions, policies, processes, practices that are going on. You know, we were there when Scarman happened, weren't we? At least if you weren't there, you'd know about it because our memories as black communities don't fade with generations because we we tell it we tell it to our to our next generation so our young people know about scarman they will know about the the lawrence inquiry and the promised changes there yet we've still got institutions that are institutionally racist even despite all that was done in the lawrence inquiry so and we're not even angry enough that nothing has changed, that we are still seeing, that young people are still growing up from city to city to city. They look at the public sector, they look at the people leading that city, they look at the people in decision-making uh, positions and they're all white. Nothing looks and feels like them and their energies and their aspirations and what they want to see. So when are we going to wake up and make this change happen. Every institution needs to change. What happened 
to the change that was meant to happen at the top? When was that 5% reflection of our communities going to happen? 5%, as small as that, that was all that was required uh, from the legislation. And we can't even achieve that. And nobody's shouting about that. Nobody's challenging that. We're not angry enough, but our young people are saying, we ain't waiting for this to happen slowly. We want change now. And we've got to be ready to be standing shoulder to shoulder to make this happen with them um, so that this change happens. We can't enter into allowing this to die because, and if it does, we have a responsibility. So let's not just see this as just passion. Let's see this as a real moment, a real turning point, a real opportunity for change to happen. That's what that's that's what's got to happen out of this. That's what's got to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Absolutely. It is, I think, personally, and I think we're all saying the same, it's a significant point in time and we have got to leverage that to make the changes that are necessary. Okay, so I've got one um, last question that I can ask that you all answer. So what are the key demands we need to make to make a more equal economy emerging from the crisis? So you said, so uh, and how long have we got to, to kind of answer this? Because because there's a whole lot of <laughs> <laughs> things that I've, that I've, so I've, I've we've, we've, got. <laughs> we've got a, about if you could just do three minutes each tops well, that would well, be good well, can, can, I, can I can I talk about um one thing that I think should be part of our demands at the moment because as a trade unionist one of the things that we always talk about is that you've got to have a demand you can't just um, turn up you know there's got to be something that you're saying is something that we have to fight for one of the things that we've been fighting for for a long time and given the international nature of what we're talking about and given what happened over the weekend um, with the removal of that statue um, down in Bristol from that slaver um, I think there's one issue that we have to get back on the agenda and that's called reparations I think we have to start talking really, really seriously about that again and linking the struggle for reparations um, with the Black Lives Matter campaign. I, I, I see an absolute natural kind of coming together um, of those campaigns. I see a natural coming together of the demands that are being made for, um, for justice um, because we haven't had justice yet from the enslavement of our, our ancestors and I want justice um, for that. Um, I could walk down the road next to um, to somebody, to a black man or woman. We could be related um, in, in ancestry, but I will, I will probably never know. And that is something that is unacceptable in these, in these times, that we still haven't been repaid um, for the enslavement of our ancestors. In fact, we all paid, those of us who've been in work, uh, up to 2015, we paid. Yeah. those slavers for the privilege in inverted commas um, of being enslaved by um, by them and that is completely unacceptable so in terms of a demand let's put reparations back on the agenda right at the top of the agenda again thank you roger murad yeah i, I i'll just add to uh, roger's point there i mean people forget and certainly the abolitionists who always pat themselves on the back that whilst uh, the slave masters got were compensated, slaves were not actually themselves compensated. And it's, a, it's a still something that's left a large sore there and it needs to be dealt with. And I'm happy to join in any demands on that front because I think we can make uh, sway on those arguments. I think they've lost the intellectual basis if you put it in those kind of simple terms. As for the immediate uh, things that we need to, to have happening in the economy uh, for BAME communities, I think we've... Uh, come to a point where at least even the Tories have had to value the health of the, uh, the nation. And we've got to make sure that that investment is made in the health sector, uh, the NHS, that it's not under, uh, un un under threats of any uh, cuts or what have you. I think it would be a horrendous mistake on their part, quite honestly, uh, to do that. But in that context, we've got to make sure we highlight the inequalities in health amongst all our various communities and show clearly why there are stark realities. I've lost two cousins as a result of this um, um, virus. 
And it's something which we've got to target very carefully. There are things that I don't understand quite honestly, the science, but I understand the structural position. I understand that if you're in overcrowded uh, accommodation, you're more likely to pick up the virus. That if you're working on the front line, uh, there's more chances of you picking uh, picking it up, even though you've been told that, uh, even though you, 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 you've been told that it's social distance and what have you. And on the back of that, it's much wider investment. Uh, the, the reality is um, it's never been easier for a government to raise money. It was virtually negative interest rates. We need something major to happen. And that structural change has to happen also in the economy. We need to shift it environmentally where there's a lot more labour intensive jobs and the kind of things I think young people want to do um, and, and, uh, and will be excited about doing. So let's, let's push that. And I know trade union colleagues are keen to do that and see sectors like the car industry go from making cars with um, uh, petrol engines to electric cars. I think that's the kind of thing we need to do. And there are people out there who know what to do. I want to see homes um, made more um, environmentally um, healthy uh, as well as uh, less admissions. And that can be done with the right investment. Those are the kind of programs that should employ uh, working people of any uh, background, um, but make sure there's particular programs targeted from those which are underrepresented in those uh, uh, sectors of the economy. So I, I think that's another thing which I think Arise can help form that agenda. And this is all going to happen very quickly. So let's make sure we put our ideas together on the table and, and run with them. Thank you, Murad. And finally, Claudia. Well, look, you know, when we start to talk about the economy, and we reflect on what's happening, actually. What is clear is we have to understand that the lynching of George Floyd uh, was a clear catalyst for people to march for justice. But it's not uh, what's keeping, it's not just what's keeping uh, black young people now joined with others on the street. <laughs> What people are very clearly understanding is their experiences, which have been generational, actually, is that that knee is on their neck. You know, they are being held down. Their daily experiences is one where they, they've not been able to move forward because their daily life is being defined by racism uh, in this country. As young as people are, their experience is racism and they want an end to it because if they're going to make a, a, and be able to benefit from any growth in the economy, any movement, then that knee has to be off that neck, their necks. Uh, it has to be off our necks as black communities. Otherwise, where is the fair share and access uh, to uh, a shared wealth, if you like? We are in a, re a, a recession. The chancellor basically called it. You know, you need three months or three uh, sets of figures to call it formally a recession. But we, we know we're in a recession. And we know that history has, has told us that when we're in a recession, the people that fare worse are black communities. And we don't want to be doing, we don't want to be the ones that fare worse. You know, this uh, uh, coronavirus has shown us that capitalism has no answers. You know, it's not been the billionaires and the uh, and 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 the, the the wealthy that have taken us out of this crisis, or that we've had to rely on. It has been the nurses, uh, the cleaners, uh, the, the 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 shop uh, workers that have been the ones that have uh, been the ones that we've relied on, and that therefore suggests how you must re reset society. And we need to fight for that change and demand it and let nobody forget what's happened and ensure that people, because too quick, people will forget um, what, um, what, 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 is, what has happened. And we can't go back to business as usual. For the sake of our children, we cannot go back to business as, as usual. This economy um, also says, as, I, as I've indicated, that our thinking has to be global. We've seen how, when the coronavirus happened, that countries were in self-lockdown from each other. 
There was no global strategy of working together. There was nothing prepared. There was no engagement and understanding that we are internationalists, that we need to be working together to find solutions in this world. So, you know, we can't be here as black communities in the UK and watch the what's happening to the global south and to our countries uh, uh, elsewhere, where um, where even despite this global uh, this uh, this pandemic, we're seeing um, you know uh, African uh, poorer countries having to spend more on debt than they are on healthcare for their uh, communities. We can't uh, sit here and watch um, in uh, 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 across the world. You know, people, wars are still happening. That that Britain is still complicit in wars and that we haven't even got a global ceasefire. And we only have to look at what's happening in the Yemen to understand what we're talking about here. So, you know, we need to just um, make these changes in terms of our economy in a way that's going to actually benefit and enable um, black communities to be at the forefront of um, the the economic um, uh, 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 progress, um, and and in order to do that, we've got to end the systemic and structural uh, racisms uh, that is holding people back. And it's every aspect of society um, there is racism deeply ingrained. And when our young people were taking heat on the streets, we weren't you know shouting about it enough as a society. When our young people were just dying, we weren't shouting enough, shouting enough about it as a society. There is nothing more important than life. And that is what this uh, coronavirus has shown us. Nothing more important than life. The death, the lynching of George Floyd uh, uh, showed us this. The coronavirus and its inequalities as it affects um, uh, as it affects black communities has shown us this. And then we can't forget it. We can't forget it and therefore we must put life first and we must ensure that life means ending these structural inequalities and systemic inequalities. And we must ensure we call out racism wherever we see it. And we can't have a country that is led by racists. That can't work, whether here or in America, we can't uh, go forward on that concept. Thank you, Claudia. Absolutely, totally 100% agree with that final comment there. Okay, so um, obviously we're about to close our meeting now. So I just want to thank everyone for participating tonight and thank you to our amazing speakers. Um, there are many important battles ahead and we need to make sure that Black Lives Matter is not just a rallying cry, but a daily reality, as you have heard all of our speakers call out tonight. We also know just how important our campaigning for people, health and the planet to ensure that these are put before private profit our international solidarity is even more essential in these times. We must keep working together to insist on no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics. And that not, is, not only is a better world possible, but when we win that better world, it's with transformative change with an end to racism. So just before, um, we finish the meeting. I'll just let you know about our next event. So the next event in the Arise Online programme is this Saturday, the 13th of June at 2 p.m. with John McDonnell. You'll have seen that in the um, Q&A in the chat and international guests. The theme is uh, from a broken economy to a people's economy, the international change we need. So please ensure you've signed up for that. I just want to thank our speakers again. You've been absolutely awesome tonight night so that's it thank you see you all soon bye are we still live possibly still yeah yeah <laughs> i think you might need to drop off
See ya. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Nadia, I think you're okay to go as well, actually. Right. Too. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Bye.